This is Firewatch. It's a walking simulator that came out in 2016. It was very popular. It's contemporaneous with The Witness, actually. They released about uh, just a week or two apart. And what you can see here is a player attempting to climb up the Firewatch Tower and being unable to do so due to bugs in the movement system. Now, since I didn't work on Firewatch, I don't know the exact nature of these bugs. This could be due to the streaming system failing to stream in collision geometry. It could be due to state errors inside the movement system itself. Uh, there's tons of different ways these bugs can happen, but the end result is always the same. The player becomes frustrated and they are unable to finish their game. Now, this happens a lot in Firewatch, as it does in many games, actually. Here's a player falling off of a cliff into an area that they should never actually be able to get to, and as a result, they can't really get back. They end up in a place where the game's geometry doesn't really exist, uh, and they're just kind of stranded outside the map. Similarly, there's uh, places where the edges of the map are supposed to be blocked, like in this case, uh, by a tree and a, and a stone. But of course, the player can sneak through them because the blockage is not quite complete. As a result, again, they end up outside the map, uh, possibly not able to get back through or possibly sometimes able to get back through, but it's still a bad experience to end up, you know, seeing all of this unfinished geometry. Uh, similarly, one of the things that can happen in Firewatch is you can get stuck inside geometry. Uh, sometimes you can get out, like the player did here, but oftentimes when you get out, you end up in other stuck geometry, like the player finds himself here, where they are unable to actually get out of the secondary place they got to after they got unstuck from the original geometry. Finally, there are other situations that could just be gameplay specific, like maybe the designers placed a wall here to prevent the player from doing something, or I'm not really sure, but uh, as a result, the player looks like they could get there, but of course they can't get there. Now, Firewatch is far from the only game to have these problems. I don't want to pick on that game. Tons of games have them. Walking simulators almost all have them. This has gone home. Here are the players getting stuck in a door. They then can't move, so they pretty much have to end the game there. If they open the door, they will be unable to move. Uh, this is everyone's gone to the rapture, and uh, in this case, not everyone goes to the rapture. The player actually goes down into the grass. Uh, and sees the world from below. This is the vanishing of Ethan Carter, uh, and it is also the vanishing of the cave floor. And here we are underneath the map again, uh, looking back up at the cave to see what it looks like. I suppose that's kind of helpful for mapping. Uh, this is Ether 1, and the player falls kind of down into some geometry and then backs up a little, only to find that they have fallen uh, into the Ether, I suppose, and uh, out of the world. And, and then they're looking back up, sadly, at the place that they were actually still trying to walk around on. Now, I didn't pick walking simulators because they are somehow the only ones who have this problem. Actually, games of all kinds that involve player movement seem to have this problem. We see it in everything, AAA games and indie games. We see it in first-person shooters. We see it in, uh, in any type of genre that the player can move around in that fashion. Uh, and the thing to sort of underscore here is, well, I don't really want to talk too much about those other genres of games because I'm going to talk about the Witnesses movement system today, and it's closest to a walking simulator in terms of its requirements. Although it is not a walking simulator, it's a puzzle game, uh, the movement requirements are similar to a walking simulator. The player just walks around. That's how they move around the world. Now, when I first came on the project in 2012, uh, I wrote a system called Walk Monster, and this is it in action right here. You can see it sort of randomly branching out. The white lines you see on the screen are kind of the path that a fictional sort of like searching player is taking to find regions of the world they can get to. This was a not a particularly good search method, I realized right away, so I switched to a flood filling algorithm, which you can see here, which gives you a better understanding of where the player can go, but it had trouble around edges. As you can see, it had this ringing backfill kind of problem that happened around edges. Uh, but very quickly, only this is only a few weeks of work uh, to get one of these, it's not hard. I came up with this other system I call localized directional sampling, uh, and it works pretty well to kind of flood fill a map and see where the player can go from a starting position. I wrote this up in an article. I called this Walk Monster, the system. Uh, and we were pretty happy about that. We were like, this is going to be pretty great. This is going to be something we can use Walk Monster to test the areas, and maybe that'll make it so we don't have as many bugs uh, as we see in all of these other games. Well, uh, this lecture is the follow-up, in a sense, to that article. 
And it's not about how well Walk Monster worked. In practice, actually, Walk Monster was never used at all. This talk is about how we got rid of Walk Monster and actually made something way, way better. Uh, my name is Casey Muratori. I did the movement system on The Witness, and this is my attempt to summarize all of the things we did and why. Now, uh, the first thing to understand about this kind of a system is where these bugs are coming from. Everyone has them, so it's not sloppy programming. They're not simple mistakes. These are errors that are sort of fundamental to how the problem is normally solved. Now, I'm going to talk about a property called reversibility that is uh, key to getting rid of these bugs. What I call reversibility is the understanding that if I can get from a point A to a point B in one direction, I can get from B back to A by going the opposite direction. I, it is literally a reversible system. And similarly, it involves the concept that if I were to break up a path into smaller segments, so if it is D distance from B to A, if I use some fraction of D distance, then walking the remainder of the fraction should still get me back to A. So breaking up a path should also work. This is sort of a way of saying that my movement should be directionally independent and it should be distance independent. So no matter how fast I walk or what direction I walk, the paths I can walk should all be the same, because if I can guarantee that, then the player can never get stuck. Okay, this is harder than it sounds. Even if your system doesn't generate these from floating point error, algorithmic bugs, other kinds of things that you could easily have, it's also easy to include things in your system that will make that not be true right off the bat. For example, if your system is a hopping-based system or a gravity-based system, you immediately fail this check because a player can step off of something that is too high for them to step back onto, and that can is potentially unreversible if those areas aren't connected. Similarly, if you have anything where speed is a factor or time step is involved in the computation, Unless you do this very carefully, you can easily end up in situations where trying to move one direction through, say, a small aperture allows movement, but moving backwards doesn't allow that same movement. Uh, and in, that's very simple to see, and a lot of games have this, where you can get out of somewhere and then can't, somehow can't get back in, right? Now, there's a second property that I think we always want in systems like this that has nothing to do with the robustness of the movement system. And that is that we also need ways of visualizing what the movement system will do, because otherwise we can't tell if game designers have successfully walled off areas that the player's not supposed to get to. So for example, if I have A and B and I want to know, can I get from one to the other, and maybe is there a gap in the geometry that they can walk through, I need a way to answer that question. So that has nothing to do with bugs, that's just a feature that we're going to need. All right, now maybe that doesn't sound like that hard of a problem, uh, and maybe it's not in certain circumstances, but what you have to understand is that the way that these games are created does not lend themselves to these kinds of secure guarantees. And the reason for that is on the screen right now. This is the walk geometry from a small section of the witness. You can see that it's basically just a bunch of triangle sheets slammed together, self-intersecting, unconnected. They're completely arbitrary. And even the level designer probably has no idea what should be going on here, right? They just imported some geometry, smushed it together, uh, and there's really no coherent statement here about where the player should and shouldn't be able to walk. So it's actually a very difficult cons constructive solid geometry problem um, <clears throat> in order to figure out how this should work in the first place. Now add to that the fact that most games, the witness included, have a bunch of markup sitting on top of the walkable geometry uh, that says where the player can't go or special places the player can go that maybe they can't always go or things like this. And you're looking at that on the screen right now. These fins that you see placed throughout the world are basically pinning regions that force the player to stay closer to a path or further in on a cliff to shape their experience so that it feels more natural the way that they're walking. And so all of that has to come together as well and be considered in the solution. So again, really, really underdefined, ill-defined geometry coming in, and to expect these beautiful solutions coming out is a big ask. 
Now, if that weren't bad enough, there's an additional big ask that was on the witnesses collision system, and that was that John had had a number of problems on the project with pre-computation systems. They had a light mapping pre-computation system and a level of detail pre-computation system. These things were slow, they ran offline, and they made the development process very error prone because you never really knew whether you were running with the latest version of light maps or the latest version of uh, level of detail. And it was just, it added a lot of complexity to a process. And when you get to a certain level of complexity, you start to have problems with that. So John said, look, if you need to use pre-computation, you absolutely need to, that's okay, but I would really like it if we could do this without pre-computation. I was not optimistic that could be done. I wasn't optimistic about it, but we had the time, it was my job to look into it, so why not try? That left us with three primary goal statements. The first one, number one, no pre-computation. The second one, try to guarantee that reversibility that I talked about, where the algorithm itself cannot produce bugs in player movement. Um, number three was, can we get that visualization where we can see where the player can go in an exact sense, so we know precisely where they can and can't move. Uh, and then late in the project, much to my dismay, although uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, the team found that they thought they could actually hit 60 frames a second locked on the PlayStation 4 uh, if the collision system took no more than one millisecond per frame on a PlayStation 4 CPU. Now that, in and of itself, isn't that scary. One millisecond is a long time on a PlayStation 4 CPU. Um, but remember, with that number one, no pre-computation, I think anyone who's done uh, CSG style work before is probably also sweating a little bit when they see number one and number four put together, even before we start talking about number two, which itself is a really big uh, ask as well. Okay, so the first thing I want to uh, point out is that movement systems themselves need some idea of how they're fundamentally going to go about moving the player from one place to another, okay? Uh, so there's three primary ways that I categorize these systems, uh, and I'll take them from left to right on the diagram that you see on the screen right now. So on the left, we have what I call search in time. And search in time means that I'm going to start at the player's current location, I'm going to go towards the result, and I'm going to look maybe like in the middle here, and then maybe between the middle and the end, and then back, and so on, to sort of test to see how far along the movement that they requested, I can actually get them. And then eventually I find where they would hit a wall or something, and they stop, and that's, you know, where they end up. That's the move. Uh, the middle one is another option. It's called reverse search in space. That's what I call it, or reverse P. This is when you just let the player embed themselves into some geometry, uh, and then you look for a way to push them out of the geometry such that they are no longer colliding at the end of the move, right? So you, like, let them go into it a little, and then you push them back out, hopefully within one time step so they don't see that happen, but you're doing that internally. Now, finally, uh, there's one more way. It's very uncommon. I don't really know. I can't even cite a game that does this, but there's one more way. Um, it's called forward search in space, uh, or just search in P, as I call it. And this is sort of the opposite of the reverse P version. This is saying, look, instead of looking to see if the player collides and then looking for some place to place them out of that, let's break up the world into little cells and let's just search for the places we can put the player that don't intersect. So it's searching empty space instead of, like it's searching through empty space rather than searching through filled space for empty space, right? Now we actually chose that one for the witness. It's very rare, again, I don't know, uh, I can't cite another game that does it, that doesn't mean there isn't, I just don't know of any. Um, that's the one we actually ended up with. And the reason we ended up with it is because of two really important contributions that it makes to the algorithm if you go this route. The first one uh, is that it doesn't matter where you are in the world or what your move is. If you break the world up into consistent cells, you have floating point consistency. All the inputs to the system become the same because they're based on a cell, not the location of the player or their target. And then the second thing is that, hey, if you have to break up the world into cells to search them for player movement, 
that immediately gives you a way to visualize what the movement can be. Draw the cells. So it's good for both of our t of our goals in the middle there, besides the pre-computation and the, the uh, one millisecond time. Those two middle goals, reversibility and visualization, it helps with both of those. Now, it would be great if we just had a set of world cells. We could write this algorithm probably straight away. But the tough part is that we don't. So what we need to do is figure out a way to go from the completely unorganized geometry that we're getting in to some organized set of pretty nicely searchable connected cells that we can use to figure out where the player can go. That is the central challenge of this walk system. Now remember this, like I showed you before, is what we're taking in. Triangles all stacked on top of each other, fins for blockers that move out areas. How do we start making sense of this? Well, the first thing that we want to do is to figure out a way to break the problem down into discrete pieces we can reason about. And the primary way that I do that in the witness is at the outset, I break things into vertical lines up and straight up and down that I call poles which can effectively linearize a single point in the world uh, into a line of intersections with walkable geometry. So I take all of the polygons and I take a vertical drop through the world and I look and say, where does this vertical drop intersect um, the, the triangles that are being input, those green walkable triangles? That gives me a nice ordered one dimensional list of points in the world I can now start to reason about. And what is the first reasoning that I can do about these points? Well, actually, I can now go to our model of the player, which in the witness, as in many games, is a cylinder. It's a good, nice shape that slides around things easily. It feels good to move as a cylinder. That's why games use it. I can look at our player model and start to work with it. Now, the way we build our cylinder in the witness is we build it in two parts. The player model has a height, that cylinder, there's a height of the cylinder, but it also has uh, sort of two derived heights. One is called the leg height and one is called the effective height. So the total height of the player is broken up into HE and HT in this diagram. I'm sorry, HE and HL in this diagram. Um, and what that is is saying, look, although the player has an effective height, HE, that we will collide, we're considering the bottom part of the player to be like the player's legs where they could just step over things. So we're not gonna collide that with anything. So rather than a cylinder that's rooted on the ground, we actually have a cylinder that's floating above the ground and we assume that the legs can walk. So the first thing we use the cylinder for in our player model is we look at that pole through space and we project the effective height of the player over onto the pole and say, look, any point that is not more than that cylinder height above another point is effectively not possible to stand on because you would hit your head on the other walkable piece. So that eliminates, right, the, the, the possible uh, place for the player to, to, uh, to go. So that cleans up a bunch of things along that, that route, right? Now, in order to turn this into actual walkable geometry, a line through space is, is not something that's a valid thing you can use uh, to walk on. It's just a bunch of points on a vertical line, right? So we need to go from poles uh, to having something we can actually stand on a surface. And the way we do that is we expand out to say that four poles placed in a grid-like fashion form what I call a walk cell. That's the next building block that we leverage up from our walk poles. A walk cell is the understanding of where the walkable triangles intersect those poles in space in a four poster uh, sort of cell through space. Now what you can see here is this allows me to create surfaces out of poles by using where those poles intersect the walkable geometry and where they do not. So in this case you see I've circled an area where they do not intersect to figure out what the walkable surface must have looked like. So the first thing I wanna do here is take the points that were inside and I want to conceptually connect them. I want to say these inside points, if I start at the highest one and I walk downward, 
connecting the points in this walk cell, I have reproduced something that looks sort of like the walkable surface, right? Sort of like it, not quite. And this is what I call a ring or the beginning of a ring. But there's one more step that I have to do to really find the actual walkable surface. And that's to respect the fact that some of the points were actually sort of facing towards an outside point. This is called a walk edge, right? It's two points that were connected where we know that the pole that was that they are facing was outside. So the surface ended somewhere in between that edge and the outside. So how do we use that information? Well, now let's look at the top down version of this where we take that single walk cell that I showed before and we have a bunch of them. So we've gridded space with these walk cells. We're doing a bunch of them now. So from the top down, here's two more walkable triangles. The first thing we do, just like before, right, is we're saying for each of these things, remember each one of these is a pole in space, find the intersection. So I'm going to circle all the ones that would have had an intersection with these walkable triangles, right, at least one. And those are the inside points. Now we're going to see everywhere one of these inside points connects with an outside point, the walkable surface must have passed through those edges, right? See? So I find them. And now we connect those to find the walkable edge. Now, you'll notice here that the walk edge would have made a truncated corner. That's not exactly what I do. I actually have an algorithm that finds exact corners, and I'm going to talk about that a little later. So just pretend for now we can find the exact corner, even though I haven't said how yet, because this is sort of an advanced feature of the algorithm. So now we have the walkable edge. That's what those triangles actually looked like when they passed through the system, no matter how stacked on top of each other they were. But remember, the player's not supposed to walk all the way to the edge. The player's cylinder is supposed to stop before it gets there because it's a cylinder. So the point in the center of the cylinder that's the player's position isn't supposed to get all the way to the edge, just the edge of the cylinder is. But we can solve that problem on this grid now. By walking through all of these points we've found, and using an extrusion of the player cylinder along the walkable edge, as I'm drawing here, to eliminate all of the points that would have been taken out. So I'm taking out those points now, right? These are ones the cylinder would have hit. Now I can just repeat the same process, find the insides and outsides, find the intersections along those edges, and I've now shrunk, by just doing the same thing over again, I've shrunk those walkable rings into actual rings the player can stand on as a point rather than as a cylinder, which gives me the exact picture of where the player can stand. And by the way, I can do this for any blocker, not just the player cylinder's uh, walkable edge blockers, but anything the level designer lays down, which solves that problem as well. Okay, so once we have the rings, how do we move the player? Here's a close-up of the rings I found in the last diagram, right? And what I want to do now is I want to start at a player location and move to a new one. How do I figure out how far they can go? Well, the first thing I do is find where the player starts. What ring are they in at the start? I then look for the closest point on that ring to the motion vector, right? To the place they were trying to go. I then crawl outward to connected rings, rings that are connected to that ring that share a common edge, and I repeat the process. I keep doing this for as far as I can go, flood filling the walkable surface. And then when I'm done, I have a collection of closest points on the rings to the destination. And I can just accept the one that is closest to that target. That's this in this case. And that's the furthest the player could go. Problem solved. That's literally it. That's the result. Let's watch it in action. Here's the player walking through the witness. Uh, they're going to walk past this little uh, sort of corridor there and up the stairs. Well, if we look at the path they took, it's this purple line. Um, it's actually not a line. It's a series of little purple hatch marks uh, that you can't quite make out, but they're, you know, because they're quite close together. Uh, if we look at just the middle section there, and we look at just one point, that point right there, first we can see for the local movement, uh, this is all of the those rasterized poles, the intersection with the walkable surface. All of the white crosshairs are places where a walkable triangle intersected one of those poles. And we search a wide region around the player because remember, we have to find edges of walkable surfaces to push them inward. 
Then what we do is we search the rings right around the player's motion to see what the closest point would be. And that's the green uh, elements you see here. And finally, we you know use each of those rings to find the closest points on triangulated versions of the ring. And that's the cyan points uh, that you'll see here in a second. Each ring gets its own set of closest points, right? So each of those cyan dots is for a triangulation of each of the green ring elements. The cyan points are the closest points uh, on that ring. Okay, and of course, uh, what I'm going to do here in a second is just circle. I don't know if you can really see this. It depends uh, on how good the projection is, but uh, I circle the which one is actually the closest point there, and that's the one they'll get accepted. Okay, here is a more complex visualization. Here's going up the stairs. You can see the system pooling in geometry here. Here's the rasterization phase. It's rasterizing individual triangles. Whites are in, blacks are out for each individual triangle. Uh, same is true on the on the grass there. And then you can see now the red lines are adding individual blocking edges for an edge in the walkable uh, surface. Green points now are rasterizing in points versus out points for those blockers. Um, and then finally, we're going to do uh, building of rings. Again, build the build the rings for that wobble service and then find the cyan points to the closest points to accept the move. That's a lot of stuff stacked on top of each other. Let's look at each one individually. So here is the rasterized walkable triangle in and out, in and out again, going through each walkable triangle that it found in the region to rasterize it. Notice there's ones down on the grass there, right? That's another set because the walk system doesn't know yet which one of those is going to be closest to the player uh, where they're standing. Now, each of these is an edge of the walkable region, like that diagram I drew where I said we sweep the player cylinder. This is us sweeping the player cylinder right here. Well, it's not really sweeping yet. It's adding them to be swept, I should say. Now we're actually sweeping the player cylinder um, using edges that we have found either from blockers or from the walkable surface. Here's those surfaces now getting uh, swept through, right? These are all saying they're green. They passed. They did not get knocked out by the blocker, so they can be considered. Finally, we're going to say find the rings, and now let's step through each closest point on each triangle in each ring looking for the closest one. And when we find that closest one, we accept it and we accept the move. Now, you might ask, why are we only searching the ones up, up on the top of the stairs? Why aren't we searching ones on the bottom of the stairs, these points down here that you saw get rasterized? The reason for that is that we don't actually ever get here for three reasons. Reason number one, uh, is that we don't actually have any uh, way to get there, right? They're not connected. Reason number two is they got removed by blockers, right? They've actually been taken out by blockers. And reason number three, as you can see more clearly in this uh, illustration of the actual case I showed at the beginning, all of that walks around on top of each other, reason number three is that pole occlusion I showed at the beginning where the walk cylinder shadows points from higher points. Hopefully you can actually see here that itself eliminates so many points. These are all the points knocked out by pole occlusion because there were higher points. So those get, get swept away before we even have a chance to connect them. Um, and that's really important to, to understand about this as well. One more time, let's look at a collision here. We ram into a tree. Here's rasterizing. And what we're going to look at here is rasterizing blockers. So here are the blocking triangles from this tree that get rasterized in. And what you'll see here is when we build the actual ring itself, I'm going to step through it. You can see it actually building the ring around those blockers. You see how it found the intersections and it built rings that were kind of shaped around the blockers, right? So that's how we produce exact collision geometry in the region of complex blockers that rasterize themselves in. Okay. Um, so that's the system in practice. Let's talk about some specifics. This is what our player cylinder actually looks like. Uh, the player cylinder itself can, you know, have its size changed to suit your needs. And what you can see here is this, the effect of changing the radius of the player cylinder, um, is to change how close to walls you can get. Um, and this has real consequences for your game design. For example, here in the spec ruins, you can see this was the geometry that we started with, right? Kind of allows some diagonal corners and stuff like that, um, but it's thin. If we change the player cylinder to be too large, you actually can't pass through narrow things anymore. They're just simply too narrow. Um, and the player's cylinder just literally can't fit through those spaces. So if you watch here, me actually increase the size, you can see it shrink and shrink and shrink till eventually it can't 
uh, be passed through anymore. Now that you may think, well, okay, maybe we should make it as small as possible. This is me making it smaller. You can see it getting wider. I can walk closer to the edge. Well, there's actually a problem with that too. If you make it too small, it, your game's near clip plane has to be further in than the walk cylinder. Otherwise, you can accidentally look into geometry. You can walk right into geometry. Like, this is me doing that here. If I, this is with the smaller walk cylinder, you can see it just wouldn't, you'd be sticking your face in geometry all the time and it would uh, be a very bad gameplay experience. So you need it to be back a bit, right? That's pretty crucial. All right. So another thing about the walk cylinder, again, is that leg height. That leg height is the clearance over obstacles on the ground. And so here is the leg height we actually use. If we were to use the entire cylinder, like you see here, uh, what would happen is like that entire wall would all be impassable. So the, the, the player couldn't actually walk over it, even though it looks like it should be trivial to walk over. And so as I raise the cylinder, you can see me raising the leg height here, and you can see it becomes more and more passable as you go. So we use a fairly high leg height in the witness, not quite halfway, but fairly high, again, to make that uh, work better. Now, one more thing is grid density, the solving grid density. What you can see here is me doing a walk along a cylinder, and it just glides nicely. It glides nicely because here's the geometry to glide along. But you can see if I increase the resolution up very high for the walk grid, see how there's an edge, a hard edge there? That makes the player get stuck in the hard edge. Why did that edge appear? Well, it appeared because, again, a lot of times the geometry created by the level designers is just all overlapping stuff. And what ends up happening is they sometimes put blockers in places, this red blocker here, I don't know if you can see that uh, cleanly enough on the projection, but that red blocker here actually interpenetrates the stairs. So if we look from the top down, it, it kind of cuts in in the middle of the stairs and creates an edge because that's where those aren't actually placed. The problem with this is we don't want the level designers to spend all their time cleaning this up. So if you just use a lower resolution, the lowest you could tolerate and still have the movement feel good around edges, you actually get a really big win here because it helps smooth over those bumps, uh, which is actually just better for everybody. It saves the level designers time and feels cleaner uh, when the player is walking along. They're not getting caught on every little thing. Now, all of these visualizations I've shown you are possible because this system, because we produce the cells, gives us that visualization. And we get to see the exact visualization. So not like on the left where there's a wall and a grid, where the grid goes right up to the wall, and that's what you see. We actually see the, the thing extruded by the player cylinder. So we see the properly, exactly eroded version of the surface that you actually walk on. It's actually exactly the thing you can walk on. So in the witness, we get to see uh, that exact visualization, which again is a really huge advantage because I can show you things like I'm showing you here, but the level designers can also see them. So it's really nice that way. Now, uh, to just to underscore this, here's it happening in game. If I turn off that shrinking, this is what you would actually get for a walkable surface, right? Uh, if we didn't have that, the radius, the radius was effectively zero of the player. Okay, that's what it would look like. And when we turn erosion back on, you can see that it shrinks in to show the actual places the player can stand exactly. Um, now, because there's a corner in this screenshot, let me now go to the thing I, I glossed over originally, which is how we solve cornering. Uh, we want to get exact corners, and normally what would happen in a scheme like this, which is typically called implicit surface tessellation scheme, uh, what you would get is at a corner, like here, you would get a truncated corner. So you'd get like a, a thing that cuts across the corner, uh, even though the geometry probably didn't look like that. What we do to try to recover what the geometry inside the cell of a corner looks like is we introduce two synthetic edges at all of our corners, and we solve for the intersection at those edges as well as the original edges. This gives us two points on each edge, effectively, to form a line we can extrapolate those two lines through the two edges and find the line's intersection, which recovers the geometry that probably created those intersections in the first place. This is a novel scheme. I've never seen it presented anywhere else, so I don't know if it was something that uh, was invented for the witness or not, but it may have been. It's pretty cool, and it helps give you exact cornering and implicit surface tessellation, something that you normally don't get. Again, this dotted line is what you would have gotten, and that's almost certainly wrong uh, in almost all cases. Okay, um, let's uh, now talk about the sort of last 
um, I guess I want to say prong of our of our four pronged requirements here, and that is one millisecond CPU time on the PlayStation 4. This is something I can't really cover. It's probably a talk in itself, all the things that we did specifically to try and hit that. But what I can say uh, in short is that the main way we accomplished this uh, was I just had really good instrumentation. So I built a custom instrumentation system for the performance uh, of the, the Witnesses Walk system. You see it running here. It ran in real time on top of the system, both on the PlayStation 4 and on the PC. And what you could do is walk around and get complete real-time stats uh, with color-coded diagrams at all times to tell you everything you might want to know about the inputs to the system, how many walkables there were, how many blockers there were, how many rings were generated, all these sorts of things. Uh, how much, and then how much time each thing took, how much time did it spend finding intersections, how much time did you spend gathering geometry, finding uh, re edge refinement, cornering, walk ring search, walk ring building, blah, blah, blah. So it was very easy to find out what was going on, and this was crucial. Similarly, the other thing that we had was I made a system that would remember everywhere in the world that was slow and allow me to run automated tests that would warp back to those places uh, and re-simulate them to take performance samples. This allowed me to test optimizations very quickly and in an automated fashion on the PS4 remotely, and that was really the only way we were able to get all the uh, optimizations done in time. I did almost all the PS4 optimizations in one week of time um, because that's all I had. I was part-time on the project, and so that was really the only way we were able to make that happen in such a short period. All right, let me uh, sort of go back and uh, summarize everything I just said before we take a look at the system in action um, in the actual game. So first, the thing we do is we rasterize all the walkable triangles into poles. And part of this process involves us removing uh, the sort of intersections with the poles that can't be possible because of the player cylinder intersecting them. Then we add blockers for walkable edges uh, that we found in that sort of initial first pass. We combined those walk edge blockers and any blockers that come from geometry that level designers have said is supposed to be collidable, whether synthetic or actual, and we rasterize those into the pole grid to remove any places that you couldn't be standing that we thought you could stand before. Um, and then finally, we enter a multi-phase uh, part of the system, which attempts to construct and evaluate rings that you can stand on um, from those input points that we are left with. Uh, this involves first connecting uh, those sort of uh, inside points around the rings together into, uh, you know, uh, sort of coherent, standable ring surfaces. It involves connecting uh, those rings together. It involves refining anywhere there was an edge between an inside and an outside point so that we can find like a, a, an accurate representation of the system. And finally, it involves sort of like a search uh, either for the closest point to the player to start the ring walk or to find the closest point to the destination to do the end uh, of the ring walk. And by the way, this is a sort of summary. We actually do steps A and B as part of two as well because we sort of need to produce a pseudo walkable surface to find the original walk edge to begin with to do the erosion process. So it's actually done sort of twice once in step two and once in step four uh, as a combination. So, how well did all this work? Here is Walk Monster, the thing that we killed. You can see that even in time lapse, it's slow. Uh, I don't know how long it took to create a minute or two to get this far, and you can see how slow it's like never going to get much larger than this. It's just way, way too slow. Uh, and the results it produces are okay, but they're not conclusive. I mean, they're just sort of probing edges and guessing where the edges probably are. So it's all right, but it's not exact, right? And that's what we have. Here is the thing we replaced it with. It's called Walk Manifold. This is not time-lapse. This is real-time. And what you can see here is we can actually walk map basically the entire island if we want to uh, in only, say, a, you know, a minute or so. We can do the entire island. So it's, it's exponentially faster than the old system. And unlike the old system, which produced a sort of probed version of what the walkable area might be, this is actually a visualization of exactly what the walkable area is. So this is saying, look, if you were to place the player in any one of these white mesh sections, 
They could walk anywhere in it. Exactly that. Per period. No compromises. Now we also have other ways of visualizing it. Here you can see I've turned on sort of a, a boundary edge hatch visualization. It makes it easier to see so it's not all these crazy meshes stacked up on top of each other. Um, furthermore, we have a, a nice version that extrudes sort of fake walls upwards to show you uh, where you would hit from ground level. This makes it really easy to walk around and move around and see what's going on uh, in that respect. Um, and furthermore, we have a lot of tools for level designers. So here, if you use a small region, it's real time. That's how fast the system is. It can show you the exact CSG results in real time always. So when level designers place things like obstacles or move them around, they can actually see specifically if the player can pass between two things. No guessing. They have the exact unrefutable answer every time. And this makes it much easier to edit areas. We also have multimodal versions uh, where the player can, I'm sorry, the editor could go in and see a large version slowly and a local version quickly. So they'll always have real-time update of the section they're editing and then post uh, sort of uh, almost real-time, but not quite, of the whole you know, sort of region they're editing. We then have another mode, and this is really useful. You can play the game, like this is just me playing the game. And while playing the game, you can actually turn on the grid and see it in real time as you walk around with an added benefit which is that not only can you see the walkable uh, triangles as input here, which I've turned on in green, but it also only shows you the places you could reach from your current position. So it doesn't show you things you couldn't walk to. That means this is actually the things the player can get to from where they are full stop, right? No guessing. This actually, because it's real time, animates as well so when they look at doors or something when a level designer plays looks at doors they can see exactly what happens to the walkable region while they work on it this helps prevent bugs like this one people thought was a bug it was intentional and we know this is true people thought you weren't supposed to be able to walk over the final panel that maybe that was a bug absolutely not we totally knew that and the walk system told us that that was john's design he wanted players to be able to skip the hardest puzzle in some of these if possible so some of these the purple panels specifically you could do that with as you can see level designers immediately knew that was true watch again what happens when they play open you can see there's no way to get to the other side till the last panel now you can see it right? So this visualization told you everything you needed to know, and there was really no risk of a level designer being confused. If they wanted to know if a level is walkable, they could. How robust is the system? It's unbreakable, as far as I know. It's literally never been broken um, by anyone at any time. This is me using a debug key. This is not time-lapse. This is real-time, flying at way higher than game legal speeds, through the witness to see if the walk system ever allows you to interpenetrate anything or get stuck, and you can't. You can't do it. It's because, again, it's always about moving through discretized space and guaranteedly pushing you, putting you in a place that is connected to your existing location, so it just can't fail. So, in a sense, we were able to solve all of the things uh, on that initial requirement list. One, two, three, and four. However, that's not all the ways that you can have bugs in player motion. So now I will talk about the bugs we still had uh, and we knew we could have because this is only solving the bugs that are caused by the movement system. So one type of bug you can still have is just bugs in your gameplay code. Here is an example of a player uh, who figured out that by loading a saved game, interacting with a panel and not stopping while they load their other save game actually allows them to edit the walk light bridge and remove the thing they were standing on in this save game. Uh, now we had sort of a defense in depth strategy to solve this problem so this actually doesn't produce a game breaking bug in the witness. The reason is because the walk system does a panic. It says, there's nothing I could stand on here. And it falls back to a system that John added, which just places the player at a known good location if the walk system says, I can't find anywhere to put the player. So again, I wish we didn't have that bug, but fortunately, thanks to a sort of a backup system John made to solve gameplay bugs like this, it actually prevented the player from having a bad experience. So that was good. Now, there was one that wasn't good. This one was my fault. The streaming system in the witness 
did have problems paging and collision geometry fast enough for the players to walk on the PS4 because sometimes the hard drive is slow. Late in development, John asked if we could change the walk system to allow movement in areas where things had not been paged in by just preventing the player from walking in the sphere of the things that aren't paged in. I reluctantly agreed to this because I couldn't think of a reason why not to. There was a reason not to, and I probably understood it earlier when I had originally prevented the movement system from allowing you to do that. Um, I can't go into detail about why it's bad, it just is bad, and there was very rare but one or two bugs where players did hit that and had a bad experience where that really did ruin their save game. I uh, had them revert that change, so I believe now they went back to the original way my system worked, which didn't have that bug. I shouldn't have agreed to it. I did. Uh, I, probably the lesson there is keep better notes of why you made a system do something one way, because you may have done something specifically to prevent a bug that you will forget why later. Uh, the final bug we had was this bug. Uh, it's the boat glitch. And this is that the boat... Actually, um, there's surfaces level designers forgot about that they left in the world. Um, and if you got the boat close enough to one of those surfaces, you could step out onto it. Uh, total bug should never have happened. Not a bug in the physical movement system. It's just the bug in the construction of the world. This is all legal stuff that the walk system is supposed to allow you to do. Why was this bug in the game? The bug is in the game because nobody ever ran the boat around with walk grid enabled. If they had, we would have found it. They didn't, so we didn't. The big lesson here is just when you have your playtesters playtest, if you build a system like this, require many hours of them playtesting with the walk grid on. I don't know why we didn't do that. Again, I was only part-time on the product, so I wasn't even in charge of playtesting. I couldn't say, um, but lesson learned. This would have eliminated probably the only bug that people really hit in practice. Because those are the three total bugs that I know about. Um, and both of the ones that we actually had that are game breaking, so the boat one and the streaming bug, the streaming bug could have prevented by just not doing the thing that I already kind of knew I shouldn't have done. Uh, and the other one for the boat was just like, use the visualization system. It's in there for a reason. If we just insisted on that, we easily would have seen it. Um, so that's it. Uh, I think the collision system in the witness was a really big success. I'm definitely proud of it. I think it was a major step forward for these kinds of systems. But there's plenty more to do. There's lots of ways that you can think about preventing walk bugs that are um, outside the scope of that system. Uh, I'd love for you to think about them uh, when you're working on games in the future and how you can maybe contribute to the process of removing these kinds of bugs uh, from things like walking simulators and puzzle games where there's not a lot of excuse for them because we can make technology that makes it less likely for them to occur. Um, and uh, I hope also maybe that showing that it's easy, uh, or maybe not easy, but possible to show level designers exact, precise collision information about what they are creating uh, could probably help a lot of these games, like all the ones I showed at the beginning, um, can help level designers construct worlds that don't have the problems that, that we currently have, which will produce much more enjoyable experiences for players uh, and a lot less raging on forums. Uh, I believe we will have time for questions. I don't necessarily know whether we do or don't, so I'll have to refer to someone else for that. Uh, if we do have time for questions, I'll be happy to take all of your questions. If we don't have time for questions, feel free to come af up after uh, the talk, or I'll try to be around the conference in general, talk, uh, come up and, uh, and ask me, and I'd be happy to cover any more specifics um, that I wasn't able to cover. It was a very quick talk in terms of the number of things it had to cover um, versus the number of things that are actually involved in the system. And so by necessity, I had to gloss over a lot of things. Thanks so much for listening, uh, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.